<clears throat> uh, lesson three is on writing binary and polyatomic ionic compounds. So we're going to talk about the electrostatic ratios for binary ionic compounds, reading table E, which is the polyatomic ions reference, and ra electrostatic ratios for polyatomic ion compounds. So we've talked about this before, electrostatic attraction. It's actually in video lesson one. So again, if you have a negative charge to your electrostatic field, that means you have more electrons than normal. If you have a positive charge to your electrostatic field, you know you have less electrons than normal. And we understand that stability means a neutral charge. So when two atoms are bound together, when they're in their ion forms, they should be stable, making them happy. That means the sum of the positive charges is equal to the sum of the negative charges. And we're now going to be using these characters to represent the different charges in different types of bonds. So before we start, we have to understand what is a binary compound. A binary ionic compound is a salt consisting of only two elements in which both elements are ions, a cation, which has a positive charge, and an anion, which has a negative charge. This is why we've discussed that an ionic compound is made up of a metal and a nonmetal. So looking at the four examples on the bottom, which ones would be considered binary, only consisting of two elements? Well, looking right now from left to right, we're noticing on the far right the CuSO4. This is not considered to be binary because it has three elements, copper, sulfur, and oxygen. Therefore, all of these guys over here, like magnesium chloride, calcium oxide, and aluminum fluoride, these are binary because they contain two elements. And this you can remember from our Unit 1 video lessons. So in an ionic bond, equal charges from the cation, the metal, and equal charge from the nonmetal, the anion, will cancel each other out to make a neutral compound. In this situation, we have one metal to one non-metal. Looking at the charges on their foreheads, they represent a positive one on the left and a negative one on the right. Together, when you add them up, they would neutralize each other. So how does this bonding occur? The electronegative pull from the non-metal, because non-metals have very high electronegativity or the willingness to gain electrons, will pull the cation towards itself. Since we have a one positive charge, and we're adding it to a one negative one charge. Together, mathematically, they would be stable because positive one plus negative one is zero. So here are some very basic examples of one to one elemental bonding. So we're starting off with sodium and chlorine. When you have sodium and chlorine, you have to write down what their ions are, and that's found specifically on the periodic table of elements. You will notice for some of the nonmetals that they have multiple charges, but you should only use the one on the very top of their oxidative states. Remember, metals lose their valence electrons. Nonmetals will gain until they get a full octet. So looking at our first example of sodium and chlorine, you notice that sodium has a plus one charge and chlorine has a negative one charge. Together, you only need one of each element to make a bond. So you get the formula NaCl. Next we have rubidium and iodine. Rubidium has a plus one charge and iodine has a negative one. So together they make the chemical compound rubidium iodine. You guys should do number three and four on your own. Now looking at this, we're seeing that we have a nonmetal with a negative two charge. Because it has a negative two charge, it requires two of the positive one cations to make a bond. So again, in this situation, the anion with the stronger electronegative pull is pulling the cations towards itself. But to neutralize itself, it needs two of the positive one charges to balance out one of the negative two charges. And remember, we're talking about binary ionic compounds, which means you can only have two different kind of elements. So you can't substitute the positive one for something that has a positive two charge. If you are working with a metal that only gives away one electron, you just continuously add that positive one charge until you have enough to balance out the anion. So in this situation, we have two metals for every one nonmetal. Now we're looking at the flip. Now we're noticing that our metal is a positive two cation. That means this guy probably either comes from the D block section or group two of the periodic table. 
because he has a positive two charge, he would require two of the negative one charged anions. Again, because anions are more electronegative than cations, they would be pulling separately the cation towards themselves. In this situation, again, you have one positive cation with a positive two charge, and now you have two of these negative one cations, and together mathematically, they would bind with zero as their charge. Sometimes you're also going to notice that you have a positive two cation, and sometimes it will bind to a negative two anion. Again, the anion is going to be grabbing and pulling that cation towards it because of its electronegative pull. But in this situation, you still only need one of the cations to bind to one of the anions. So again, one positive two cation plus one negative two anion makes stability. Okay, we call these formula units when we get their ratios in the lowest whole number of the atoms involved. This is also a term that we discussed in the review book. It's called empirical formula. So an empirical formula is uh, known as a formula unit when we're talking about any ionic compound. It's the lowest whole number of the ratio of the atoms. So when magnesium has a positive two charge and oxygen has a negative two charge, since they technically can uh, end up being two to two, you're going to want to end up reducing that ratio so that you end up with a one-to-one -one ratio of the atoms. If you have two groups of elements and they're both even numbers, you can most likely simplify them into a formula unit or, again, a lower ratio of atoms in a compound. So here are some examples, sodium and oxygen, where sodium has a positive one charge and oxygen has a negative two charge. Again, we're taking these straight out of the reference tables. You end up needing two positive ones to balance out the negative two which is why it comes out to be a two to one ratio of Na to oxygen. Calcium and oxygen. Calcium has a positive two charge. Oxygen only has a negative two charge. So when you take the fact that you have positive two and a negative two, they've already balanced each other out to neutral. So we only have a one to one ratio here. Lithium and tellurium, beryllium and bromine, try these out on your own. So now what happens if we have a nonmetal that has a negative three charge? If you're noticing that one negative three anion, which could be anything like nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, these guys, for example, would have to require three of the positive one cations to bind up to it. So again, in this situation, you would need, you would need three positive one cations to neutralize one of the negative three anions. Again, the electronegative pull pulls the cations towards the anions, thus making a bond. So here are some examples of three to one bonding. So in the first example, you have aluminum and fluorine. And when you find them on the periodic table, aluminum has a positive three charge and fluorine has a negative one. Therefore, you would need three fluorines to give you a negative three charge to balance out the positive three charge from the aluminum. Indium, chemical symbol is IN is being matched up with bromine, Br. When you find them on the periodic table, they're very similar to the previous example, giving you the final formula of InBr3. Why are they similar to the previous example? I believe they're similar because of the number of valence electrons they have. And oh. both of these elements in the questions fall in the same families or the same groups. So that's why they chemically work the that same. That is why they chemically work the same. Oh. All right, try number three and four in your notes. Sometimes you have to use the least common multiple to determine your ratio of metal ions to non-metal ions. So here is a scenario where we have a positive two cation and a negative three anion. What number does two and three have least in common? So six. Okay, so if we're shooting for six, how many cations do we need if every cation has a positive two charge? So you would need three cations, and then for the anion, because it has a negative three, we would need two. two. Oh, so it looks something like this. So you have your three atoms of a positive two cation, and you have your two atoms of a negative three anion. 
and again the electronegative pull pulls them together and you're noticing that a positive 6 is being added to a negative 6 together that's 0. So everything on this screen is electrically neutral. So here's some more examples. Aluminum and oxygen. Again, when you find these guys on the periodic table, you'll notice that aluminum has a positive 3 charge and oxygen has a negative 2. The LCM between 3 and 2 is 6. Therefore, how many aluminums do you need to get 6? Well, you need 2 of them. How many oxygens do you need to get 6? You need 3 of them. So your final formula is Al2O3. So when you do the next example of calcium and nitrogen, calcium has a positive 2 charge and nitrogen has a negative 3 charge. Therefore, the LCM is still 6. You need to have three calciums to give you a positive six charge and two nitrogens to give you a negative six charge. Thus, when they add together, they make themselves neutral. Try problems three and four on your own. So when we use table E, which is going to be your selected polyatomic ions, and you guys should be looking at this section right now in your reference tables, you will notice that a majority of the ions are going to be negative, with the exception of the three positives in the top left-hand corner. The three positives would follow the rules of, as the red cation, while the rest of them follow the rules of the negative blue anion. Notice that they're called polyatomic ions. Poly means many, atomic means atom. These are made of multiple atoms creating one whole charge. Now, the thing you guys have to remember is that these unique ions have their own numbers of elements in their own bonds. So... When we come over to this chart, looking at some of the more common types of polyatomic ions that you will see, the formulas can never change. If you change the formula, you're changing chemistry. You are altering what it is. You break it, you buy it with your grade. Yeah, do not mess these up. If we give you the formula for sulfate, it's always SO4. But the charge of a sulfate is always a negative 2. Go back and just rewatch the videos of what happens if you have a negative 2 charge and you want to bind it to, let's say, positive 1 cations. It's the same rule. Nothing has changed. The only thing that's changed is that the formulas are now multiple letters and we, not just one element. We recommend putting these in parentheses whenever you use them. So, for example, how many sodium cations would you need to stabilize with phosphate? Phosphate is a negative 3 polyatomic anion with the formula of PO4. Notice how the PO4 is in parentheses? Oh, so how many sodiums do we need? Well, sodium is a positive 1 charge. Mm -hmm. Phosphate has that negative 3 charge. So to balance this out, you would need 3 positive charges. Oh, so I would need 3 sodium cations to balance out with 1 phosphate ion. So when you add those together you get a final formula of Na3PO4. Notice that we kept the phosphate ion in parentheses the whole time. It's going to make writing these formulas incredibly easy if you follow that rule of using the parentheses. So now let's try these examples. Thinking of the ways that ions can electrostatically attract to each other, try to determine the formulas of the ions when they're bonded. So we start with magnesium with a positive 2 charge and phosphate. You need to use table E to determine the charge of phosphate. So you're noticing that magnesium and its plus 2 charge is making PO4 with a negative 3 charge. So when you find the LCM between 2 and 3, again that is 6, you would need 3 magnesiums, which is why there's a yellow 3 next to the magnesium, and you need 2 groups of the phosphates to thus make a neutral bond. So sodium and carbonate has a similar pattern, uh, except that we're going to use different ions. So sodium is that Na positive 1. Carbonate is the CO3 with the negative 2. You have to figure out what is the least common multiple between the two. So you end up needing two Na's and one CO3. Now when you add these all together, you're still getting that neutral charge. Let's try some more examples. So now you have aluminum and you're mixing it with sulfate. Aluminum has a positive 3 charge and sulfate is going to have a negative 2 charge. Again, the SO4 does not change. You do not alter the SO4. You can only alter the little numbers in yellow that you're going to see in a second. So again, find the LCM. Again, that again, ironically, is 6. So that means you need to have two aluminums for every three groups of sulfates. 
lithium, which is the positive one charge, and nitrate, which also has a negative one charge. You have to find how many of each you need to make it stable, which in this case is just one to one. So you end up with just LiNO3.